Okay, so for the first part of the homework 1-4 key, we'll hopefully get through about the first half of this or so. So question one, can the velocity of an object at an instant in time be greater in magnitude than the average velocity over a time interval? Why or why not? The short to it is yes. Yes, it can, right? In fact, the only time that we know that the two are equal is if it were a constant velocity. Um, but in fact, it can be greater than. So I'll give you a graphical representation, and I'll also kind of explain it as I go through. Right, but if I've got a position versus time graph, as long as it's not a constant velocity, so as long as this isn't linear, then we know that the instantaneous and the average velocity will at least at some points be different. Um, so if I just make this kind of a generic graph, maybe it does something more or less like this. Right? So if I ask you to find the average velocity from, say, this point in time to this point in time, the average velocity would be the straight line slope between the two. I obviously missed, but that's okay. Right, it'd be the straight line going between those two points. The instantaneous velocity anywhere along the way is going to vary a whole lot, right? So at some points, maybe that, like up here, that slope would actually be a little bit less than the slope between those two points. So is it possible for it to be less in magnitude? Yeah, that's definitely possible. Is it possible for it to be greater in magnitude? Well, yeah, that's possible too, right? If I chose this slope over here, the tangent line would be much steeper than this, this slope right here. Okay, so the bottom line is yes. Um, in fact, the only time we know the instantaneous velocity is equal to the average velocity is if it is a constant velocity. So if we know that it is not a constant velocity, um, then there has to be at least some moment where the instantaneous velocity was higher than the average, and there has to be at least some moment where the instantaneous is lower than the average, right? And that just makes sense. If you have an average velocity, and it's not always the same, and there has to be a point where it was higher and a point where it was lower in order to get that average in the first place. Um, so question one, a good question. Make sure you're comfortable thinking your way through. Question two is a pretty standard uh, representation of, no, do notice here it is a velocity versus time graph and not a position versus time graph. Okay, so the motion of the car and truck represented below. It says that at time of t equals zero, the two vehicles were right next to each other. So it does tell us that their initial positions were both the same. So then which of these following can we rule as true since t equals zero? So the truck will have covered more distance, the car will have traveled a further distance, uh, the truck and car will have traveled the same distance, and the car will be moving faster. Well, if we look at this, right, it's a velocity versus time graph, and at that time there, it looks like, if anything, they're moving the same speed. It doesn't look like the car is necessarily going any faster. Um, so we can pretty safely rule out d. The rest of these all have to do with the distance traveled. And the big conclusion here is how do we find the distance traveled on a velocity versus time graph? Well, to find the distance traveled, we find the area underneath the curve. So the car has traveled this area, right? But then if you compare that with the area of the truck, the truck has traveled this entire rectangle's worth of area. So the truck has covered about twice as much area and therefore twice as much distance or displacement as the car. So the correct answer here, A, hopefully that one was pretty easy, but the truck will have traveled further than the car because it was traveling at a higher velocity for a longer period of time. The car worked its way up to that velocity, um, but wasn't traveling at that constant velocity for nearly as long. Um, so anyway, making sure you're comfortable with these types of Question three, we saw a question almost identical to this. The only difference here is it says a graph of the position, whereas before we saw the velocity. So if an object is moving with a non-zero acceleration, so if we know that the acceleration graph is a non-zero constant, um, then we know that the velocity graph would be linear, because if the acceleration is not zero, then the velocity graph has a slope that is constant but not zero. And because this is linear, we know that one more integration here, my position graph would have to be parabolic in nature because again this would be a linear function so y equals mx plus b and when we integrate that one more time we would end up with a power of two somewhere um, and in fact we'd end up with a power of two and possibly a power of one but no matter what the case we're going to get some type of parabola maybe skewed it may be shifted but definitely a parabola in, in nature this question was hopefully uh, mostly review right balls thrown directly upward and experiences no air resistance what do we know about the motion and obviously all of these answers have to do with the acceleration um, and so the big thing there the big concept is if a ball is in the air no matter what it do does as it goes up we know that it does slow down and then pick up speed
but we know that the acceleration is always pulling down. Even if we work with it sometimes as positive or sometimes as negative, we know that in fact the acceleration is always downward during the entire time that the ball is in the air, right? And if there's no air resistance, we would say that this is free fall because the only acceleration, the only force acting on it is gravity, which is pulling straight down. Um, so hopefully this was pretty straightforward. This one's a little bit trickier, but hopefully still not too bad. So which of the following could represent the vertical position? So we're looking for a position, which is a delta x function, as a function of time for free fall. Well, if it's in free fall, we know that there is an acceleration because the acceleration is 9.8 right there's an acceleration due to gravity which means that my velocity graph if I was thinking in terms of calculus my velocity would be the integration of this so it'd be 9.8 t plus or minus whatever and then my position graph would be 9.8 t squared divided by 2 so 4.9 t squared plus or minus whatever else we may have but the reason I mentioned that is it's very important that if we've got something in free fall the position would actually be parabolic, right? It would be a quadratic function. Um, so looking through these graphs, the only one that makes any sense is C, right? The position graph wouldn't be B because it's not a straight line. It doesn't have a constant velocity as it falls through the air. So we can rule out B. A doesn't make any sense because A would suggest that it pauses for a period of time that's more than just an instant, right? So this would say that the ball somehow reached the highest point at two seconds and then just kind of hung up there for three seconds before it started to fall back down. So that doesn't make any sense. Um, D is maybe the easiest distractor here because it does reach that point and then turn back around. But again, the fact that we know that it is a curve and not just a straight line tells us it can't be D. So like I said, this is maybe a little bit trickier, but hopefully you guys were able to reason your way through it pretty well. It would be a parabola and therefore it has to be Question six here says a package is dropped from a helicopter that is moving upward. It takes 16 seconds before it hits the ground. How high above the ground was it? Now, last year, these were the types of problems that we typically bo broke up at the top of the path. Um, but this year, we can actually work more with functions. And so we're actually going to just avoid that. And what I mean by that is I'm just going to, instead of defining delta x, I'm going to define my initial and my final positions separately. So I want to know how high it was off the ground. I'm really looking for then what's my initial position. So let's go through and identify everything that we know. Well, we know the helicopter was initially moving upward at 15 meters per second, and therefore the package was also moving upward at 15 meters per second. So my initial velocity was a positive 15 meters per second. My uh, final velocity I don't necessarily know because I don't know when it hits the ground or how fast it's moving. The acceleration I would know, right, because it would be in free fall. Because I defined upward as positive, I'm going to define the acceleration as negative 9.80 meters per second squared. Uh, my final position I also know because I know that it hits the ground. So ultimately it hits the ground. Again, I'm looking for my initial position, which we can call our height or whatever you want to call that, x or h. And then I know the time. So I know it took 16 seconds for it to go up and down. So this is where last year we would have broken the problem up, but we actually don't need to do that. Instead, if I just set up this equation, right, so if I set up my, my uh, displacement as a function of time here, if I plug in all the variables, because I've defined upward as positive and acceleration as negative, I can just actually plug in all of these measurements and then solve for my initial position here. So I know that it was moving at 15 meters per second times 16 seconds. And then I'm going to go ahead and subtract this. This is negative 9.8 times 1 half, so negative 4.9 t squared, which actually I know t squared is 16. So let's just make that 16 squared. At this point, if you look at the equation, you only have one variable. And yes, this does work for the entire trip. So even though we know that the projectile is actually doing something more or less like this, because we have the time, we don't have to worry about breaking it up. We can actually just use it as a fluid motion here. So if I solve this equation for x sub 0, so obviously just calculating this side and then adding or subtracting that quantity over, when I solve for x 0, I get 1014.4 meters. Now for what it's worth, if you wanted to break this problem into two stages, so if you wanted to break it into its motion going upward and then its motion going downward, that's absolutely fine. You should have gotten about the same measurement. So you could find the time that it takes to go up subtract that from the 16 and then find your total displacement falling down 
and then you would just want to subtract the total from how high it rose above that. Okay, so obviously doing that route is a lot more complicated than just doing it once and being done with it. Okay, so it is very nice that we can actually just kind of shortcut this as long as we define the position separately and we're careful about the directions of our velocity and our acceleration. Question seven then is a lot like question six. I'm gonna go ahead and write the correct answer down, which I meant to do on um, that previous one, but that's okay. So if you've got this answer and you're confident with this answer, you can obviously skip ahead and you don't have to listen. Um, but this one is almost identical to question six, except they give us different information, right? We're still gonna work about the same approach though. So they told us our starting position is 90 meters above the ground. The ball rises, falls, and strikes the ground. Its initial velocity is 36.2. What is the time that it takes to hit the ground? The reason I say this is almost identical is it's really the exact same relationship. We just know different variables. So I again know the initial velocity is 36.2. I am defining that as positive, which means my acceleration is going to be negative 9.80. My initial position I'm going to define as a positive 90 meters. My final position when it hits the ground below would be zero. Um, and again, I'm just defining this as positive because I'm defining up as positive and negative as down. Um, so I've got that information. And then I'm looking for the time. So if you look through here, you have four of the five variables that we need in order to do this equation just like we did last time. So this truly is just the exact same relationship. The big, the big piece of it that I want to make sure you're comfortable with here is the fact that, once again, you don't actually have to break it up at the top and then going all the way down. Can you do it that way? Absolutely. If you're more comfortable doing it that way, go for it. Um, but we don't have to, right? You don't have to do so. The only downside of calculating it this way is you will notice right here, you do get a quadratic equation, right? You get a quadratic function. So the only, the only plus side of breaking it up at the top is you can at least just work with a couple linear equations um, that are a little bit easier to solve or at least equations that don't have both a t and a t squared. But in this case, it really doesn't matter either way. Now, you do get two possible answers. You get either negative 1.964 or 9.35. When you solve the quadratic equation, these are the possible answers you get. Negative time doesn't make any sense. That would be as if somehow we went back in motion before the ball was thrown. So that doesn't really make any sense. But the reason for that is, again, this is a parabola. And so the parabola is going to have two points where it reaches that same value. Okay, so anyway, the correct answer here, again, 9.35 seconds. If you broke it up at the top, you should get about the exact same thing. So um, I, think it, I think if you broke this up going up, it was like 3.69 seconds to go up, and then about 5.66 seconds to go all the way from the top back down. But if you add those two up, you do get the same total. Okay, so the, the big moral of this story is make sure you're comfortable either breaking it up at top or hopefully more easily just using this all as a single equation and solving for that time. The correct answer here for number eight, if you want to check it, is about 10.0 or 10.045 meters. That's how tall the flagpole is. This one is a little bit maybe trickier than some of these questions, but here's my flagpole, right? And then I take the ball, I throw it, it takes 0.5 seconds to reach the top, and then after a total time of uh, 4.1 seconds, it's reached the height of the flagpole again. And that's the biggest piece here is just making sure you're comfortable understanding uh, the concept. So what that tells me is it 0.5 seconds to go up to that height, and then it took 3.6 seconds to go up and then back to that height again. So that's important because it tells me then it takes 1.8 seconds to go up and 1.8 seconds to come back down. Okay, so the reason that's helpful then is that allows me to break up the times, right? I can use the total time that it takes to go up. So the total time that it takes to go up is 2.3 seconds just by adding those two. And then once I have the total time to go up, I can use VOTAT to find the initial velocity. My final velocity at the top would be zero. My initial velocity plus the acceleration of gravity times time. So 9.8 times 2.3. So I've got my initial velocity then of about 22.5, 22.54. And once I have that initial velocity, if I want to find the flagpole, I'm just going to use this equation where the acceleration is negative 9.8, the time is 0 0.5 seconds, and my initial velocity is 22.54. Okay, so watch your acceleration being negative, and otherwise it's just calculating. 
Um, so that's where I got the 10.045.